So 2015 is drawing to a close. And from a WWE standpoint, at least from my vantage point, mercifully and thankfully, 2015 is done. And it's time to bring in the new year that is 2016. Now, before we do that, we still got some unfinished business when it comes to the year of 2015. And as long as it took me to come up with this list, and as much as I racked my brain trying to come up with this list, I've decided to come on here and give you this list. This God, this took me long enough to come up with. Like I said, it said in a previous video, this was not a banner year for the WWE. So it's not a very good year for the bad WWE. It was a very bad year. Bad, 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 bad. 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 Worst year in WWE history? I don't think so. But a bad one nonetheless. In a large part, it was reflected in how much I struggled to come up with 10 memorable moments of the year, or the 10 most memorable moments from WWE in 2015. I mean, again, I really struggled with this list. It took me a while of racking my brain and thinking about it and trying to struggle to come up with shit to even create a list of 10. I don't even think the list is particularly good or particularly strong. Again, it's subjective. It's my opinion. It is what it is. It's just, man... I don't feel like I left anything out of any note or significance. Surely some of you will probably point out some things that, frankly, I either didn't think about because they weren't memorable or I didn't give a fuck anyways. Uh, man, I just, what a bad year. And when I think back on the year trying to create a list like the 10 most memorable moments of WWE in 2015, uh, that's what lets me know just how bad of a year it ultimately was. So anyways, enough with the foreplay, enough of the small talk. Let's get to it. Countdown list from 10 to 1, the 10 most memorable moments of WWE in 2015, according to the only voice that matters to me, frankly, most of the time, all the time, me. All right, number 10, Roman Reigns winning the 2015 Royal Rumble. Oh, the butt hurt ran strong with a lot of you, and arguably this could be a little bit higher on the list just because of the level of butt hurt that emanated from the Daniel Bryan universe after the 2015 Royal Rumble. And that match was in part memorable for the decision to even put him in there in the first place and then eliminate him kind of haphazardly halfway through in the way that they did. But Roman Reigns winning the Rumble the way he did, having The Rock be out there to <laughs> raise his head, <laughs> and Rock's looking like, oh my God, he's getting booed out of a fucking building. This is terrible. I can't even say this shit. Oh my God. I'll never forget that one. I give, I give you that. I mean, and like I said, in some ways, maybe this should be higher on the list, but it is here at number 10, Roman Reigns winning the 2015 Royal Rumble. It's not even really memorable for Reigns winning it it's himself. It's the actions and reactions of the fan base and the crowd afterwards that make it truly memorable for me. It gives it a special place in the old tarred up ticker. Number nine, Daniel Bryan having to surrender the IC title after winning it at WrestleMania, one year after being the primary story heading into WrestleMania 30, he was in the curtain jerker position at WrestleMania 31. Daniel Bryan wins the IC title and then has to immediately surrender it. And this is memorable more so just because of the fact, not even the fact that he had to surrender it, but you have to start wondering if it's the last time you're ever going to see Daniel Bryan in the WWE. More so was... WrestleMania and immediately after WrestleMania, the last time you're ever going to see Daniel Bryan wrestle again in the WWE. That, in and of itself, makes it incredibly memorable, especially when you look back at the foolishness of the fan base after Roman Reigns winning the 2015 Royal Rumble. See how many people were so pissed off and so butthurt. Imagine if they actually did have Daniel Bryan win the 2015 Royal Rumble and they actually did have him win the title of WrestleMania. Fucking stupid would that decision have looked now. I guess at the end of the day, would it really fucking mattered anyways? I don't know. Number eight, Ronda Rousey at WrestleMania. I still maintain that WrestleMania was a largely forgettable show this year, and I really didn't like it all that much. But I cannot deny that Ronda Rousey being at WrestleMania was a moment. It was a moment. You know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, well, a lot of people probably rank that up there as a higher moment, perhaps. Maybe if she hadn't have lost to Holly Holm, would I rank this higher? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but it was still a moment seeing somebody from the UFC. And at the moment, 
the UFC's biggest star in Ronda Rousey being there in the ring at WrestleMania. I mean, people we were talking about, I was talking about it too, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to have Triple H versus The Rock and Stephanie versus Ronda Rousey at WrestleMania 32. I mean, it was a moment in time. It was one of those WrestleMania moments. There's no question about it, and I can't take away from that, and that's why it belongs at number eight on the list. Number seven, Kevin Owens beating John Cena in his first WWE main roster pay-per-view match. I mean, this was a moment here is Kevin Steen, Kevin Owens. You've watched him for years on the independent scene all over the place, all over the world. You watched him in NXT, and now he comes to WWE. They send him straight at Cena, and in his first pay-per-view match, shocks the world by not only winning, but winning clean. And what many people probably feel is one of the matches of the year, if not the match of the year, was that first match between Kevin Owens and John Cena. And that was a memorable moment. Also, in part, because of what happened afterwards. <laughs> LOL, Cena wins. Hashtag Breakfast Club rules, bitches. Hashtag Cena gonna get his. And he made sure he got his. He made sure he pinned him. He made sure he tapped him out. He made sure he looked no doubt. But for the moment, Kevin Owens beating John Cena. What a statement victory in your first pay-per-view match. You beat the guy that has been the prop franchise player for a decade of the WWE. So it belongs on the list at number seven. Some of you might again rank even higher. Number six, got to go recently. Roman Reigns winning the WWE World Heavyweight Championship on Raw. This is notable because Roman Reigns had just won the title of Survivor Series to immediately lose it, only to eight days later win the goddamn thing back. But more so because it involved Vince McMahon and also the fact that they did a title change on Raw. A world title change at that, something that hadn't been done in a few years. I mean, that is a big moment. That is a memorable moment, similar to how when somebody cashes in their money in the bank, it's a memorable moment on a Raw. This most certainly classifies, because this is really setting the table for what's to come in 2016. And I think when you look back, it's one of the things you're going to remember the most, so that's why it's number six on my list. Number five, unfortunately, you learn being a WWE fan and a wrestling fan over the years that... Death is as much a part of the reality of the wrestling life as life itself. So this year, and again, this could arguably be number one on the list. Uh, but I didn't want to make the list quite feel so morbid. But, but, but it is. You know, being a wrestling fan at times is morbid. It sucks that, you know, we see all of these legends die. It sucks that... It seems like that's when the industry gets the biggest attention of all is when one of the big stars from 20, 30 years ago dies. It's the reality of the situation. It makes it tough to be a wrestling fan sometimes when you see, in this case this year, two big-time notable legends like the American Dream Dusty Rhodes and Roddy Roddy Piper pass away. And these two guys are more big, huge stars, big influences on... And I think that's part of their real legacy is the influence that they had on generations to come. How many people wanted to speak like Dusty Rhodes, maybe not with the lift, baby, because they know nobody could be like the American Dream. But talking about the charisma and the way he was able to engage and emotionally connect with the audience. And then Roddy Roddy Piper, still one of the gold standards of how to be a money-drawing, big-time main event heel in the professional wrestling business who crossed over into movies, you know, still to this day, I love going at least once or twice a year and watching They Live and Hell Comes to Frogtown. So, you know, it, it's, it's sad that they're gone. I mean, but it, it happens. And like I said, it's unfortunate. We've seen far too many of these big names pass away in recent years. See Macho Man. You know, see The Ultimate Warrior. You know, not to forget this other gentleman, I believe Nick Bockwinkle passed away this year. You know, that's another huge star from back in the day. You know, but then Dusty Rose, Roddy Roddy Piper, you know, two big, huge names in the history of the business no longer with us. And unfortunately, that's going to be one of the most memorable things that happened for the WWE in 2015, as is number four. And this is the real unfortunate thing, is that Hulk Hogan hearts the N-word. Uh, you know, they, they say... Oftentimes, and I go back to a Bobby Roode promo from a few years ago, when talking about Hogan particularly, and you know the whole thing about you have to be careful when you meet their heroes. I'm paraphrasing here, 
because they usually end up disappointing you. You know, to sit there and say that I was disappointed in Hogan was an incredible understatement. Now, look, I understand some of it was, you know, done, you know, kind of behind his back. He was, it seems like, maybe recorded against his will, maybe not, who freaking knows. Um, in some ways, maybe it's just an out-of-touch older white dad trying to show how hippie cool he is to his young son who likes rap music and so on and so forth and uh, crashing cars and permanently injuring friends. Um, you know, it's just a dad that's out of touch and he's trying to be cool and he's mad that the time's passed him by. But it's disappointing because for somebody who grew up on Hogan and somebody who's been a big fan of Hogan for so many years, and I still am, that will never, ever change. It's, it's just disheartening to know that somebody like him, that during my childhood rep represented so many of what, so much of what was supposed to be good about America. Oh, God. That's how stupid I was sick of that. Uh, that he would say these type of things. You know, and it's so bad that they tried to erase him from the network. They're taking him out of their Hall of Fame and all of this other crap. I mean... It's sad that deaths and Hulk Hogan's racist rants are two of the most memorable things for the WWE in 2015. Now, to be fair, maybe they'd be the most memorable things in any other year. But you could actually argue that they are the two most memorable things that happened in 2015 for the WWE. And that in and of itself is kind of a sad indictment of the current state of the WWE product in the year that was in 2015. Number three, though. One of my favorite moments of the fucking year. And one of my favorite kind of troll moments that I've seen in wrestling in quite some time is the laugh-off between Brock Lesnar and The Undertaker at SummerSlam. <laughs> oh my fucking lord. That is epic. That was awesome. That was timeless. And the fact that, of all people, angry, old, get the fuck off my lawn... That's my purse, I don't know you. Gives no fucks the Undertaker did. It just takes it to a whole different level, brother. Oh, fucking A. <laughs> he just went... <laughs> I'm going to be doing that shit for years. I'm going to be remembering this shit for the rest of my life. I'm going to be talking about it for years. In a year full of bad... That was one of the truly, organically, genuinely fun moments that the WWE gave me, not only this year, but in quite some time. That shit was fucking incredible. <laughs> Number two. Now we've gone on with the fun. Seth Rollins cashing in at WrestleMania. Nobody ever cashed in Money in the Bank successfully at WrestleMania. At WrestleMania 31, you kind of had this... A situation with Roman Reigns, if you went with him, people weren't going to be happy. You didn't really want to keep the belt on Brock Lesnar post-WrestleMania because that didn't do you a whole lot of good. What do you do? You create an iconic, true WrestleMania moment in a lot of ways by having Seth Rollins come out and cash in at WrestleMania. I mean, this was the thing that set the table, unfortunately not very well, for the next several months to come. But in and of itself, in that particular moment, if there's one thing that you're going to remember about WrestleMania 31, for a lot of you anyways, it's going to be Seth Rollins cashing in at WrestleMania. I thought it was well done. It was well executed. It was well-timed, perfectly placed. It was everything that I said would happen at that moment in the lead-up to the show because it was the only option, the only alternative the company had. And I'll reward the company with my admiration for this because they did what they were supposed to do. And they did what I felt they needed to do. And it created one of those truly memorable moments for the year. But number one for my money, and this is again just for my money, a lot of you are probably going to say Seth Rollins cashing in at WrestleMania. And I most certainly am not going to dispute you. If I was feeling more like in the troll mode, Undertaker and Lesnar and their laugh off at SummerSlam would probably be my number one moment of the year because from a pure fun standpoint, nothing has humored me more this year, nothing entertained me more than this year than that one little clip, that one little segment, that one little bit. That was everything to me. But number one, to me, still has to be Sting at WrestleMania 31. 
Uh, looking past the fact that it became all about the Monday Night Wars, and ultimately Vince just couldn't have Sting go over, so of course Triple H had to fucking not only win, but offer to shake Sting's hand afterwards, and shake, Sting shaking his hand like a jackass. Once you get past all of that, it was still the fact that it was Sting. And it was WrestleMania. And he was kind of the last holdout. He was the last major player that never made the jump. And I'll admit, once it didn't happen at WrestleMania 27, I really honestly didn't think it ever would. I didn't think it ever would. But it did. And no matter what, I will always remember WrestleMania 31 for one thing above all else. And even with seeing The Undertaker again. And even with Seth Rollins cashing in. The Ronda Rousey moment. The one thing I'll always remember most is the fact that that's the show that Sting actually worked at WrestleMania. It may end up being the only time he ever works at WrestleMania, which is what makes me so mad about the fact that he didn't go over Triple H at WrestleMania 31. That was the right thing to do for business. But seeing Sting, you know, it brought a lot of things full circle. It felt kind of odd in a way. It felt kind of weird in a way. It's like this is a guy that a lot of his respect for so many years was the fact that he could become a big star and be a major deal for so many years, and he never was touched by Vince. He was a virgin for Vince. He was pure. And he was like that last holdout, rebelling against the WWE machine in a lot of ways. And a lot of older fans in my age demographic or older or even a little younger respected the shit out of the man for that and admired the man for that in a lot of ways. But all those things eventually come to an end. So with that said, still, when Sting's music hits, and out from the back comes Sting, and Sting walking down the ramp at WrestleMania, that's a moment. Of all the moments that happened in 2015, some of them as outlined in this list good, some of them not, and a lot of other shitty things that happened throughout the year, the thing I will remember the most, above all else, especially because it may ultimately be the only time he ever does it, is seeing Sting wrestle at WrestleMania, and in my opinion, along with Triple H, frankly, steal the goddamn show at WrestleMania, which is something I had warned some of you about could potentially happen in the weeks leading up to that event. When people talking about this match, and people talking about that match, and so on and so forth. You know, until you got to the main event of Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns, it was Sting and Triple H's show. They owned the night. It was their match that conquered all. And I think that's appropriate. That if that's own, Sting's only WrestleMania match, he'll be remembered as the guy that still had. What a moment, though, seeing the icon Sting at WrestleMania.